All right, so let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. And if you are still in um, jet lag, good, good, good night or maybe good morning. So hopefully everyone is awake. And uh, let's get started, sure. So by the way, I'm Anand, work for PayPal Cloud Engineering. And I have a first pass uh, group of smart engineers and characters, whatever you want to call. I, I work for these guys. And uh, I have Chinmay with me. And uh, before even we go and get started, actually, I wanted to give you a little bit background about uh, how we started within PayPal and how it translated to us to build one of the bigger cloud in OpenStack. And we are running serious business on it today. So in a year back, around same, you know, October last year, uh, you know, me and Chinmay and uh, uh, we were just looking at, okay, what to do something different. I used to go for OpenStack conferences like you guys, some of you are very new to OpenStack conference. And we went, I went to you know, San Francisco first one and you know, all the other conferences. And I used to play with you know, DevStack and stuff like that and uh, looked at, okay, how can we take it to reality, right? Then I was in eBay and then moved to you know, PayPal and good. Okay, I need some systems to go and build a small lab to get started with the you know, OpenStack Cloud. Of course, I don't want to spend too much of money. I got a you know, bunch of uh, you know, servers uh, decount from our data centers just sitting there in the floor. I got all of them and you know, we racked everything ourselves and we didn't take much help from anyone. And everyone was busy during end of the year, uh, you know, capacity add and whatnot. We don't want to disturb them too much, other operational teams. Then we built it and we went to an you know, executive team and then showed a demo, okay, this is how you know, we are building the cloud and you know, uh, we, we wanted to you know, take it to the next level. Oh, well, oh, okay, it looks good. Okay, what do you guys need? And we said, yeah, so maybe we will start with a couple of uh, you know, small applications to start with and we put it into the production. By end of last year, we were running a couple of applications and you know, we spent around 200K to buy some you know, servers, we started with that. And everything looked good, and executive team said, okay, here you go. Next year started, okay, what do you guys need, tell me. And it was very easy. There was a question in one of the panel yesterday, okay, how do you guys take OpenStack your company? And there were a lot of guys thinking, okay, go to executive team, you know, convince that this, right? It was very easy for us to convince the executive management, but we got challenges bringing the rest of the organization into this. Because, you know, we, we, you know, Spayball is not a small company or maybe, you know, it's not a startup company to change the things overnight, right? We got to bring the entire organization into this. That's where the challenges started. Okay. I bought in, executive team said, okay, we bought in. Now you make sure that you bring in the rest of the organization into this. Then we did talk to you know, multiple teams and you know, they were not buying into this because there were a lot of initiatives like this earlier and that they all failed. And even I was personally asked a you know, lot of questions in one of the cloud expos in uh, San, San Francisco, maybe uh, last year, I think November time frame when cloud expo happened. Okay, do you really guys want to you know, go and build the cloud yourself or you know, use OpenStack yourself? Is it really your business, right? I said, yeah. So if you want to innovate, you innovate in every, uh, every area, not only in payments or maybe in our applications. And it is going to indirectly help all our applications team and you know, our products team to go and you know, find out whatever they need in the infrastructure level itself to make sure they can write any application, the infrastructure is just there for them. They should not worry about, okay, I need this type of special hardware to run my east-west traffic or not self traffic, okay. We'll find out all of that. But we just took OpenStack not, not to just save money on the licenses, but we used OpenStack to bridge you know, some of the gaps that we have in our data center. So that's how we approach OpenStack instead of just go and you know, just save money on the licenses. Of course, we're still you know, going to be buying the hardware from you know, multiple vendors and you know, software from, if needed from you know, multiple vendors. You know, OpenStack is one of the medium for us. Okay, this is what we use. Okay, all of you guys, you know, vendors, make sure that it is work working with OpenStack and we are ready to go and pilot in our lab. And if it work, you know, once it works for our you know, data plane, whatever we are looking for, different workloads, it is performs well, then we just go and you know, use your product. And OpenStack is one of the medium for us to connect with all these vendors. When you say, okay, there is no vendor lock-in, okay. We are going to be using the vendors. It's not that we are not going to be manufacturing hardware and software, everything ourselves, but we wanted to use OpenStack as the medium to communicate with our vendors. Right. So that's how we started, and uh, of course, you know, we took uh, you know OpenStack code. We faced you know a lot of challenges in running in large scale production, and we fixed you know some of the bugs and also you know some of the blueprints. Not even we are even still talking about you know some of the blueprints. Even though actually we didn't wait for the community, we you know went ahead and you know implemented them as uh, 
in our blueprint, uh, plugins and drivers ourselves, and we made it happen, right? And Chinmay is going to be talking about that, but uh, I just want to, you know, go you know, small introduction about PayPal. Of course, everyone knows about PayPal. There's no surprise. I don't want to, you know, go too much into that. And uh, okay, so how we are going to be, uh, you know, structuring the presentations? So basically, we are going to be mostly focusing on what are the challenges that we faced instead of going into what is OpenStack. And of course, you guys all got filled up with a lot of uh, information about OpenStack already, and you keep, uh, you know, I don't want to bore with it again and again. So the challenges specifically that we ran into to build PayPal Cloud on OpenStack for serial, serious business, right? And uh, why, how we you know, chose to go with OpenStack when there were you know, a lot of other open sources, and getting OpenStack for production prime time, and some of the success stories that we you know, already realized by using OpenStack, right? And I'll, I'll just you know, start with, uh, where's the next one? OK, first of all, you know, what we are re really trying to solve so before even you know OpenStack, it's not that actually we don't we don't have any automation because it is is very obvious for our operations team to have you know a lot of automation built around you know provisioning or you know creating our you know load balancer automation and whatnot. So we all had you know, scripts. Cloud is not, is maybe is the new name for all this automation, and uh, you know we had all of that. But only one thing what we were missing was a common set of APIs that every everyone could understand easily, right? And instead of having a, yeah, a small uh, you know, operations team within the organization, they create a bunch of scripts and uh, you know, they make sure that, okay, if you want to do this stuff, if you're getting the sticker, go and run this, you'll be fine with that, right? It's, it's all working. So it's not that it's not working. But if I want to go and talk to my you know, uh, product development team, hey guys, you have the, uh, you know, your infrastructure to go and you know, deploy your application. Okay, where is that? Okay, you, you say actually you have it. Okay, send me the IP address and all those things, right? So, we don't want to deal with the tickets. Those, that's where you know the automation breaks. It's not that actually you know automation we didn't have; it was broken when we wanted to integrate with you know different systems like PaaS or whatever, right? So that's where we really, really wanted to have a common set of APIs or the standard that everyone could easily understand, and they went, they could go ahead and uh, integrate with the you know the infrastructure easily. So that's where actually we chose to go with uh, you know some open source. And it is easier for our, again, uh, for our vendors also, they just go ahead and say, okay, it is working with OpenStack, now I could go and talk to people or ABI Inc. the company, and you just want to you know, go and pilot with your know, lab. So that's why actually we wanted to make sure that it is covering both our internal needs as well as our external facing. So it really, really helped us in that angle. And uh, also, you know, we wanted to have, yeah, earlier, before even, uh, you know, we had uh, infrastructure as a service, right? We used to create tickets, PD team, or, you know, different other teams. You know, they will take maybe a week to figure out, you know, different components of the infrastructure, what you need, DNS, or maybe you need compute itself, or the VMs, you need, you know, a couple of VMs here, a couple of VMs there in different data centers. You know, it used to take time to figure out, you know, what every application needs. So that's when actually it took so much of time for application teams to go and deploy their code. Instead, actually, we wanted to have, okay, these are all the different APIs that you need to connect. And after that, you figure out actually how, there are a bunch of uh, you know, engineers, they're smart engineers, they could figure out if you give the APIs, because the rest APIs are not rocket science for them, right? So that's how they, they started with that. And they felt initially, oh, that's looking cool, because if you are able to create a VM in two minutes, and they could do self-service, they're cool. Yeah, now I'm on my own. I don't want to talk to you know, anyone to get my infrastructure, right? So that's why actually they're all excited about it. And uh, yeah, so it is a self-service tool for them. And uh, it, it really, really enabled them to go and figure out uh, they want to have a small automation around, I want 10 VMs, but I don't want to you know, click the button all the time. They just been created you know, themselves a, uh, in a small script, and it will integrate with uh, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, different APIs or maybe the Nova CLI itself. And uh, I used to help them earlier, okay, this is how you call Nova API and all those things. But later on, I just used to refer only the GitHub. Okay, code is the documentation for them. I don't need to teach anything because they're all, you know, smart engineers and they don't, I don't need to go and say, oh, this is how you need to create, this is what the API that you need to call. All of them are part of, you know, GitHub itself and stuff. You know, we use the code, the same code that we shared across the organization and they're all you know, very happy. So one of the use case that, uh, you know, our past team had as, uh, uh, they wanted to integrate with uh, OpenStack. Yeah, of course, you know, they got, uh, they got a tenant in, uh, in a multi uh, every data center. We used to create uh, 
you know, tenant in each adolescent error, they created the VMs, they provided them the you know, credentials. They all, you know, they just went, went ahead and they created the VMs. And after that, they don't want to click the buttons, right? So they want to have a workflow, they just call IS APIs and create, uh, you know, VMs. And they call, okay, how do you use, your, uh, you know, uh, your uh, OpenStack APIs? I said, okay, just Google it, or maybe go to GitHub, this is the code, look, no, take the Nova CLI code, and instead of using Nova CLI, take the same code and put it into your code. That, as simple as that. They were all really excited about that, like how they can easily integrate with, uh, you know, open, uh, open source code instead of, you know, getting a vendor product and then you're going to have to, you know, go for the special training, understand actually specifics of uh, each individual vendor's product, right? That's how it was really, really easier for us to bring in the entire company into this whole mix within the last one year, right? And uh, we, you know, there were multiple options earlier, as I said, actually OpenStack, CloudStack, and uh, Eclipters, and we even have, you know, our own uh, IIS actually within the company, and it was a hard decision for us to go and use, you know, a new technology bring into the, you know, the company, and uh, it was very hard for us to make the choice when there were a lot of other choices. Only one thing that uh, really, really helped us for us is OpenStack, because we, it got, you know, very good, uh, you know, community support and also the backup from the foundation itself, just to keep OpenStack as clean as possible without uh, having you know, a lot of pollution within the community itself, right? So, and also we met with, uh, you know, board also, and uh, they said we are going to be making sure that OpenStack is going to be clean for all the cloud users. It's not going to be biased on a vendor A or vendor B. Okay, if you guys see something, and we all, as a community, will address that. So that gave us really, really good confidence. Just go and use OpenStack when other you know, open sources, they, it was missing the strong foundation behind. So that was one of the good decision-making points for us. And uh, when I say specific vendor logins, of course, you know, we are not going to be using anybody's distribution. That's one of the, you know, decisions that we made internally. We are going to be, you know, packaging everything ourselves, including uh, using our CI and CD. And uh, we don't want to go to a vendor if I want to, you know, use a stable Cinder or stable uh, Neutron. I don't want to go to a vendor to get a stable code. Instead, actually, we wanted to take everything from the community, and we wanted to use it only from the community, including the plugins and drivers, right? So that that that, that one of the, you know, that's how we are going to be, you know, having no vendor lock-ins. It's not that we are not going to be using the vendors. Of course, we are going to be using the load balancers or maybe, you know, the virtual networking, everything, you know, we are not going to be developing our, uh, everything ourselves, but instead, actually, we wanted to use, you know, everything from the community itself instead of, you know, a distribution from a particular vendor, right? And uh, fast growing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the developer community is going very fast and then code is getting cleaned up very often and, uh, you know, the summit every six months. Those are all the, you know, really, really good decision-making point for us to, you know, go and convince ourselves when there were, you know, a lot of other op opportunities or other tools to use within uh, the open source world itself. And, of course, you know, we don't want to innovate everything ourselves, and uh, we wanted to go and leverage uh, industry best practices. If there are multiple architects and multiple, you know, smart engineers outside of our company, we wanted to leverage that as well. So we don't want to reinvent the same thing over and over and somebody is already there solving it, right? We just wanted to go and leverage that. And uh, as we said, actually, we decided to go with OpenStack, and we looked at, and there were a lot of challenges ahead, and we couldn't just take, uh, you know, a, a dev stack as it is and put it into production, and we had to, you know, tweak uh, some stuff in OpenStack itself to meet some of our network topology or maybe some of the specific use cases within our, uh, you know, data center itself. So I will hand over to uh, Chinmay to go over actually what are all the specific things uh, that we have changed within OpenStack itself to meet our production workload. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Uh, I'm, my name is uh, Chinmay, and uh, I am one of the lead engineers in the cloud engineering team. Uh, as Anand just gave you a brief introduction of how OpenStack came into picture with PayPal, uh, let me just uh, walk you through. I mean, I'll, I'll go through the changes, some of the changes we have done in NOAA, Keystone, uh, our DNS as a service, load balance as a service, and Hopefully you guys can get some lessons if you guys tomorrow want to go and uh, go to the production level that we are at. 
so this is uh, this is a this is a picture of our stack. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a fairly simple stack. Uh, the, at, at the at the infrastructure level, we use uh, x86 computes. We have storage, uh, network load balancers, uh, software infrastructure. We run on RHEL, uh, not on Ubuntu yet. Uh, some of the some of the fun uh, the functional services that we the core services that we use is we have Nova, Cinder, Swift, Keystone, Neutron, uh, Horizon. Uh, we do, do used to have. Uh, we after that we went on and created our own uh, portal, uh, which is which was uh, based out of uh, Netflix Asgard, and uh, we have Heat uh, for our uh, for our uh, orchestration as an orchestration engine, uh, load balancer DNS. Uh, let's uh, go on to some of the changes. So let's start with NOAA and tuning it for uh, high availability. Uh, what we did here is, uh, so like we, the main concept about productionizing this OpenStack is we look at racks, right? Racks of servers. And inside PayPal production, we, we have a rack which is split into two, which is a fall zone. I mean, in the diagram, you could see there is there are two fall zones right there per rack, and those are basically our availability zones. So what we want to do is our main aim of getting scheduling done for production is when a tenant spins up VM, which the tenant would be our internal, our internal customer itself. So when he wants to spin up a VM, we want to make sure that his VMs get landed on these different availability zones. So we need our scheduler to take that into consideration. So when it was Folsom, uh, we had built our own custom uh, scheduler, which was a compute zone filter. And uh, what this used to do is, uh, compute zone is basically a combination of fall zones, so basically uh, of availability zones. So what that means is you could have like FZ1, FZ2, and FZ5 selected in one compute zone. And you can have this compute zone attached to a tenant. So what that means is whenever a tenant is going to be sp spinning up VMs, his VMs are going to be landing on one of these racks. So that's one of the changes, the custom changes that we did. Uh, we, come Grizzly, we made use of host aggregates. Uh, what host aggregates uh, helped us is, so we used host aggregates in two ways. The first way we use host aggregate is to define the availability zone of a compute node itself. And so that's the key value pair you get. And the second way is to actually use the host aggregate for our, uh, the, for our web tier and our mid tier uh, tenants. Uh, you, could, you could spin up uh, host aggregates, special host aggregates based on, your, uh, based on your compute resources. And so basically the RAM and how much uh, disk and all they have by giving the key value attributes. But the special thing about this thing is that we added uh, an extra table inside Nova, uh, which does a uh, tenant to host aggregate mapping. What that means is, as soon as, I mean, this, coming back to the same point, as soon as the tenant launches VMs, we make sure that they get exactly the, the host aggregate, the, the host in the host aggregate which are attached to that tenant. So another thing that is important here to note is a 25% distribution among fall zones. So what this means is, the example that I gave you, say for example, a tenant is, is saying that I want to be part of fall zone one, fall zone two, and fall zone five. When he spins up, say, three VMs, we want to make sure that there is an equal distribution. He doesn't land on one rack itself so that you actually get high availability. I mean, if a rack goes down or if the, if, if the top of the rack switch were to go down or there was some networking problem, he, he would still have his services up on the other racks. So, the, these are some of the changes, and the 25% distribution. The way we did it is there was a special PayPal scheduler that we special PayPal uh, filter schedule that we built, and what that does is it basically gets a per host aggregate uh, calculation of how many VMs are there. Say for I have a tenant, it would do a calculation of how many VMs are there in the host in in the host aggregate that I have across the availability zones. So it will take a look how, how full the availability, current availability zone is, and then it will go on distributing based on to make it equal, make, make it equal distribution. So these are some of the changes that you might need in a production environment. Uh, some of the other NOAA changes is, uh, say, instance host, host naming. Uh, this is a classic production use case, wherein currently in DevStack, when you get uh, when you, when you get in DevStack, if you spawn four VMs, 
uh, their names are same. And uh, in production, you wouldn't want to do that because you need unique names. And you need, basically, these are going to be put in, used in DNS. These are going to be used everywhere else in the application. So you need, uh, so we created a plugin API which makes sure that in the entire cloud development, in, in deployment, uh, you have unique host names. So basically, we give a, we generate an ID at the end, and we give a, it's, it's a format, and we can even change it based on per tenant. So what we have done is, the, we'll talk it in the keystone changes. So we have made use of keystone metadata, wherein per tenant, we can specify the host name format. So every tenant can get a different host name according to his application requirements. Uh, Auto assigning floating IPs. So this was a case wherein we, so this is for specific clouds. This is again configurable. And the thing is we needed external connectivity for VMs. So what we said is instead of a developer having to create a VM and then manually go and add a floating IP to it, what we did is we, we inserted into Nova again another plugin which talks directly to Neutron APIs and gets the floating IPs to these VMs as soon as they come up. So this has been inserted right where the instance spawn uh, code is. And then, uh, so, so, so that is one of the use cases wherein we needed external connectivity for all VMs. Again, it's configurable, it's a, it's a plugin. And uh, rack aware networking. So rack aware networking is, so, so the previous image that we saw wherein we had distributed, uh, wherein I showed you racks and we had distributed fall zones. We, have different, the way we have configured is we have different subnets for rack and uh, we want to make sure that if the VM were to land on a rack, it gets the correct IP address from that subnet. So in Grizzly, what we did is we made sure that there is a map, there is a mapping between every host name. It, we figured out what availability zone it's a part of and what subnet it's att is attached to that availability zone. And this basically helps us in, uh, in, uh, in overlay and bridged uh, mode of networking. Uh, I mean, my friend Vinay, who's sitting here, he'll be talking more about the network setup that we have. Uh, his talk is on Friday about bridged and overlays. But basically, that helps us. So if you were to talk about like overlays, wherein you have a sub subnet running throughout, say, three or throughout all racks, then you would, you, your normal logic should be intelligent to detect that, the, 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 the VM has landed on the compute, which is part of a rack, and these are all the network IDs associated with it, and these are the network IDs you st send in the requested network data structure to Neutron so that it gives you the IP from the correct networks. So that is one thing we added. Uh, leveraging config drive, so this, this is some of the cell-specific information that we pass on to the VM itself. Uh, helps us in uh, cloud init uh, stuff, so the post uh, boot install steps. Uh, NOAA conductor services, this is one a quick point I wanted to make because Grizzly brought in NOAA conductors and it's, I mean, the whole reason why NOAA conductors came in was security. Uh, they said that uh, you do not want direct connectivity to the database from the compute nodes because your guests are living there. But what this internally does, and this is specifically a scale issue, this, is, this comes into play when you have like thousands of hypervisors running. And what they're doing is every compute, before talking to the MySQL, which is actually a very periodic task, because every compute node has to do a, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of periodic tasks that go on, and everything it has to check with the MySQL, it has to put a RPC message. It is a good thing in a small environment, but I don't think it's, so it's a trade-off. The thing is, it puts a lot of load on Rabbit, and Rabbit, if it has not been scaled correctly, it can become a problem because you start dropping a lot of, you, you start seeing a lot of errors on the rabbit side and it could become a problem. So you would, might want to turn on or turn off NOAA conductor services and see how it works for you, but we currently have turned this off. Uh, so let's, let's go to some of the keystone changes. Uh, keystone changes are a, a little bit standard, so these are some of the things like integrating with LDAP, so open LDAP and uh, uh, AD. Uh, so what happens there is the, we wanted to make our users not have any special kind of authentication, so they can use their own PayPal credentials and just log into the log into the uh, the cloud. Uh, another feature related to this is the auto tenancy feature. So what this feature does is that if I were a developer, if I were to log in, I wouldn't want to go 
and talk to a cloud operator and say, okay, go and create a tenant for me. I want this, I want that. What this does, this is again specific to some of the clouds, like developer clouds, wherein a developer just wants to come in. He logs in uses his, using his LDAP credentials. What we do is we create a tenant, the ten, we create a tenant which has a name exactly same as his username. So what that does is it, 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 so it creates an automatic tenant for him and it adds his user as a, as a member role. Or it, it's configurable or you can add him as an admin to his own tenant and he can just start using the cloud. So basically he can spin up VMs with his own, uh, with the, in a, inside his own tenant and he's admin to his tenant. So that's one feature that we found useful in special clouds, like not in all, like the production clouds can be restricted. You want to go through the normal process of cloud admins sitting and knowing what tenant name you want, what are the setup, but this helps in the, the, the regular developer and QA clouds. Uh, tenant based host names and DNS zones. So this is uh, the point that I just told you before. The Keystone metadata, we have made use of this uh, to have tenant specific stuff. So it's like host names can be different per tenant. DNS zones can be different per tenant because the FQDN that we create in our, uh, that we use in our, our DNS as a service, he can have his own uh, dot something.paypal.com, like x.paypal.com or y.paypal.com. UI has been changed for this. I mean, we have done a lot of UI changes for the users to select the DNS zones that were attached to that tenant. So it's, 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 it's pretty cool because it's, it helps a lot in production environments. Client-side token caching, so a quick point about Keystone performance. Uh, the thing is, Nova, when it integrates with uh, Neutron, what happens is it creates a lot of uh, tokens. Uh, Quantum creates a lot of tokens, and what happens that Neutron, what happens there is Keystone performance takes a hit, because every time you do, uh, every time you do an authentication authorization call, it goes through an entire list of tokens, and you would want to reduce the number of tokens. So we have done on, on the Neutron side in the Nova APIs, we have done uh, uh, client ca token caching. So you guys might want to explore uh, doing some client side. I mean, Keyst I know Keystone is planning tomorrow to go to the certificate uh, based uh, infrastructure, but I do not know when it will be coming or till then, till the time we're using tokens. It's, it's an it's a important thing to keep in mind that you need, you need some caching on the client side. Uh, team admin feature. So this is one feature that we had. This this comes from Folsom. Uh, what what happened then is that in in SX and in Folsom releases we had this OS admin user, which was a general cloud admin user, and we did not want to give this role to all the users who are who want to be admins because you could literally manipulate all the tenants, uh, any anyone's tenants. So this is a specific feature which allows you to become an admin only for your team. And uh, so Grizzly, I think, handles this uh, with, with some level, but we still needed this, and we went ahead and uh, developed this anyway, so we have it. Uh, DNS as a service integration, uh, let me talk quick. So again, another production, classic production case wherein you have a, a, a VM, and in a production VM, you want to access it using host names. I mean, in a classic, in an AWS, uh, AWS world, you wouldn't have host names. You would just get IPs. But hey, at the end of the world, it's our internal production. And you just cannot say we are no longer going to be using host names. So you need DNS entries. And this is automatic. Automatic meaning this is again being plugged into NOAA. It's a plugin. And what that does is whenever an instance is spawned or an instance is destroyed, uh, we take care that DNS, we give it's, it's API driven. We have built on top of, it, it runs on bind. It uses bind, but it has REST APIs that we have created. And we can call REST APIs to give those bindings. And uh, the IP, so basically it's, it's right there again when the instance spawn success happens. It, basically you, at that time of the point of time, you know what is the IP, what is the host name of my guy. And then you would generate the, the, the zone name, which is the next point actually. So the project-based project zones which we had from Keystone, so you make a Keystone metadata call, and you actually get the zone for that tenant, and you append it to his base host name. You give this mapping to DNS, and that is taken care of. So this is automatic and handled uh, gracefully while creation and deletion. Uh, floating IPs also we handle uh, DNS. So the, the, again, the automatic floating IPs that we were creating. 
Uh, DNS is handled for the floating IPs as well. So uh, basically, you would you would need DNS as a service uh, for a classic production use case. Load balancers. So this is again. So what we wanted to do is uh, when the VMs come up, uh, you are going to use it to deploy applications. The the whole thing about it is you would want to at the end of the you would want to sit them behind a pool in, inside a pool behind a load balancer so that it starts serving traffic whatever your application running so we have integrated load balancer as a service uh, with our openstack cloud and what it does so basically we have around uh, hundreds of load balancers that we have so we do a auto discovery registration we have a load balancer as a service that we have it's a, it's, a, it's written in uh, java and it's rest api driven again and uh, what that does is you can register each and every hard physical lo hardware load balancer using an IP and uh, register it inside the service. Uh, it has rich tenants and operating facing APIs. Uh, APIs range from everything. So you could create pools, you could create web ports like i7 rules, SSL certs. Uh, there are some operating facing APIs like you could manage config sings, config restores, config backups. and uh, Basically, this is all sent. Basically, from Nova, you could just call these or any orchestration engine that is handling. You could just call after the VM creation is done. You could just call these uh, REST APIs. And uh, so, propagating changes to multiple LBs. So, the thing is to integrate load balancer service with OpenStack. What we want is the tenant specific concept. So, what that means is you should be given a tenant. You should be able to identify. This tenant is part of how many load balancers, is part of what pools, is part of what ports. So every so the REST APIs that we have given, they are similar to the OpenStack APIs, which identify everything based on a tenant ID. So it's so when a change is basically done to uh, for a particular tenant, we need to make sure that it is propagated to all the load balancers this tenant is a part of. So we keep that in mind and. Uh, have that pro propagation logic to all the load balancers. It manages even the secondary and the primary load balancing. So the change, once it's done on secondary, then we go and sync it back to the, the primary, and then that's how it's done. And change management integration. So all the load balancer changes are critical. Uh, what you want to do is you would want some accounting, some way of accounting all the changes that you did. So what this does, this is a message-based uh, change management integration that we've done. It, what it does is whenever a change is fired on a load balance, say for example, you're adding a service in the pool at a particular port, there is a ticket that gets filed, uh, that gets fired. This is PayPal specific, basically a ticket gets fired which has details of who did the change, where was it done, what, what all changes were done. And this is basically for accounting purposes. Again, a production use case that you would want to use. Uh, so, so yeah. So these are the changes that we had done in terms of the coding. I mean, taking OpenStack and actually doing the changes to it to run for our production uh, clouds. Uh, I want to call Anand again and uh, briefly go through some of the success stories, like some of the things that we have done, uh, which might be useful. Thank you. Yeah, so I already shared a couple of uh, important success that we already got. One of them is, you know, easy integration with PaaS. And, uh, you know, we didn't uh, babysit anyone to go back and, uh, you know, we discover you integrate with OpenStack because everything is open source and it's a GitHub. And they figured out themselves to integrate with uh, IS. That is one of the big wins for us. And uh, another big win is actually bringing the rest of the organization into the whole mix, you know, how we can all of us, you know, work together to make, you know, build the cloud faster for the enterprise. So that. Two things definitely I want to mention. That's a big winner for us. And, uh, and another thing is actually we built cloud. Okay, these are all REST APIs and we have you know, Horizon. And what happened was, okay, we wanted to go back and tell our users that how you can access you know, multiple parts or multiple you know, different cloud with a single username and password. And we wanted to you know, physically separate for you know, compliance reasons and stuff like that. We wanted to actually we cannot logically you know, group everything together, like you know, uh, production and non-production into the same hypervisor. We, we, are, uh, we are not yet there, and I don't know when uh, you know, uh, uh, our compliance will allow that put into you know, both workload into the same thing. So instead, what we want to do is actually we wanted to have a single point where you just log in with your username and password, then they will be able to manage you know, multiple different regions. 
at the same time multiple different uh, uh, you know projects within the same single username and password so we did that actually we built a, a ui on top of uh, uh, you know all the apis directly instead of using the cli so the reason for that actually you know we cannot upgrade all the environment with the same version within a day for example if we are running on grizzly and if we wanted to go back and then upgrade with Havana, we cannot do it overnight in all the environments, right? And at the same time, the users will, should not see any impact to the APIs or maybe the UI itself, the usage point of view actually, they are not getting affected. So what we did was actually, you know, a simple configuration config that, uh, you know, JSON file. So you put in multiple regions and uh, you just specify, okay, what are all the different keystone configuration, that's it. And after that, you know, it's a very simple jar file, it's written in Java and start managing all the different clouds across the regions with multiple different versions of OpenStack itself. So that really, really, you know, helped us to, you know, mix and match the, uh, you know, OpenStack deployment within, you know, production. So instead of, uh, posting, instead of posting us, you know, go and upgrade everything overnight and get into outage or whatever, you know, that really, really helped us a lot. And uh, some of the screenshots I could show you actually, you know, how, uh, what was built. Okay, and let, let, let me get into, you know, some of the pain points we really, you know, got into and then how we haven't, uh, you know, some of them not solved and what we solved, that we will get into that. And finally, we keep some time for you know, question and answers. And uh, dev stack, yeah, perfect. So you get your dev stack installed on your laptop and go and spin up a couple of VMs, that's all good. But if you want to go and run it in the production, that's where actually the challenges start. Right, basically, you know the RabbitMQ issues, and you know there are a lot of uh, you know compute nodes. You know the message is getting lost, and then uh, how we are going to be handling all of that, right? So that's where the uh, uh, you know pain point started for us, and we learned over the period of time actually instead of just you know okay it works and then put it into the production and let's see later. So it's not going to work for us because the it is going to affect really you know, the end users, the developers, every, every hour is important for us. We don't want to lose their productivity. And uh, we wanted to make sure, before even putting into the production, we wanted to run through our CA, CD, make sure everything is working. And uh, that is one of the reasons, actually, we just do not want to go back uh, and take something from, you know, public it and directly, you know, put it into production and look at things later, right? So we, we are not comfortable there. And we wanted to have our own CA, CD, and it's not yet perfect. And uh, we, have 80% of the confident, we take the chance and we go back and then say 20% we take the chance, but we cannot take 100% chance. And keeping up with trunk, okay, this is one of the issues that uh, we currently have. We are not on trunk, right? That is really, really biting us. For example, you know, we wanted to, we ran into some performance issues and uh, we wanted to go back and uh, look at, okay, how we could fix it. When we will talk to, talk to community in the IRC channels and all, yeah, it's being addressed in Havana, better you go and run Kavana, right? And we cannot do that because we wanted to test it and uh, be, before even go and try some of the new features, we don't know the impact, right? But we wanted to be closer to the trunk as much as possible so that actually you fix it and then run it and then contribute back. So that's one of the challenge for us. And also, you know, when we talk to our vendors also for the plugins and drivers, yeah, actually, yeah, so we, we wanted to, uh, we cannot contribute back to the stable version of previous release because, you know, community is not approving, you know, all the changes that we wanted to push upstream, right? So they want to say, okay, if you go on running on Kavana, we are fine because, you know, the fixes are in Kavana and we are not going to be backporting to Grizzly. So that's one of the challenges that we have currently and we are actively working on our CICD to make sure that we stay on the trunk, right? So, and single keystone service, of course, you know, we have multiple regions and multiple data centers and uh, multiple cells, and every cell has its own keystone today. But uh, if you have your pass layer that is integrating with IIS, you don't want to have this case go and, you know, manage multiple keystone endpoints to go and talk to your infrastructure. That is really, really adding complexity. And uh, if uh, they have to authenticate against multiple keystones and they need to, you know, get hold to the token, if you are not, uh, you know, syncing the token between the multiple regions and multiple keystone at the same time. So that is really, really a challenge for us. And we wanted to really, really get into a region-based uh, one single keystone, and it is propagating, you know, it's managing all the other cell underneath. So basically, you know, we wanted to get there, uh, one, one authentication per region instead of having uh, multiple keystone per cell or uh, per data center, right? And uh, that is one of the you know, deployment pain points that we have. 
and, uh, and uh, I think you know, there are some you know, enhancements made in Keystone and Havana that we are going to be exploring that is going to address some of the issues that we have today. And performance scalability again. So if the cluster size increases, we have uh, figured out actually we are not going to be adding all hypervisors into the same you know, cell. So we you know, made some decisions saying that okay, but the number of hypervisors is not going to be you know, more than you know, 500 or 600, then we are not going to be putting into the same you know, cell or same keystone because of you know, the traffic between your controllers and compute, specifically uh, you know, uh, the RabbitMQ. Right? We faced those kind of issues and we wanted to make sure that, okay, we are limiting for now until we go and fix all of these things into OpenStack itself, right? So that, uh, and also we were uh, exploring you know, some of the options with zero MQ, we have not yet done. And uh, there were some issues we recently faced where, you know, the VMs got deleted in the Nova database, but still sitting there in the hypervisor, right? And if you go and look at uh, the quota, everything is directed, but you cannot launch your VM because uh, you know, the hypervisor is still holding those instances. Then we had to go and create some scripts, you know, run periodically to go and clean up all of that. So these kind of things actually we have to build within Nova itself so that it consolidates between you know, the actual state, what is there in the Nova, Nova database, and what is in the reality within the compute nodes itself. So things like that actually we need to really, really you know, make sure that it is working for the real time and we don't want to end up you know, losing the resources within your cluster so that you think that actually you have capacity, but really you, know, you are running out of the capacity. These things are still lying there in your infrastructure, right? So that is really a reliability issue that we had and uh, it is going to get addressed actually very soon. And error handling, so there is another problem that uh, all, our, uh, you know, all our team actually really face, facing under. So today, okay, we have different functions within the organization where you know, we do some engineering and we have support organization and we have L1, L2 for uh, you know, different uh, you know, customer issues. So they're all getting L1, L2 calls and after that actually if something happened in your infrastructure, can everyone debug what's happening, can we bring uh, you know, open stack uh, issues. Okay, this is what happened in the error code or whatever. Take that, and if it happens this, you go and do that. Can we educate someone apart uh, from your engineering team, right? I don't think we have a good solution within open stack itself today to go and hand over things. Just you know, you go and have other guys you know to take care of your infrastructure. So basically, we need to have you know better error handling, and also you know, the log files are lying everywhere, and uh, you know, and it's randomly selected hypervisors. And you cannot go back and then look at each and individual log file to figure out, okay, how to, what happened to the VM that you created, why it failed, right? So basically we need to have, you know, of course, you have the log aggregation, we you know, put in elastic search and log stats and keep on up top of that, everything, right? Everything is good. But the problem is only engineers could understand. The normal L1, L2, you know, resources, of course, they don't have time. It's not that they cannot do it. So there are, you know, so, uh, hundreds of uh, users calling you in and you have a small set of uh, you know, support teams to support it and they cannot go back and then understand all your log files to support them, right? We need to have a better mechanism to identify, pinpoint all your failures within your infrastructure so fast to react uh, within you know, minutes instead of you know, taking you know, half hour, one hour to figure out actually what's going on in your infrastructure. So we have to build open stack towards that rather than you know just it is understandable only by engineers and it is not uh, you know working for you know other uh, other use cases operation, real operational use cases. And so this is a small team that uh, you know built all of this, and uh, you know if you want to you know, reach out to us to talk to us any of the you know lessons we are happy to share and we have to uh, happy to learn from you guys and you can send out an email at cloud at cloud at people com. And uh, I will open it for you know question and answers. Let me see whether you know I could answer some of your questions if you guys have. Yeah. 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 So it was a hard decision for us. I guess we started with uh, you know Horizon itself, right? So what happened was we rolled out this uh, you know dashboard to the end users when they created the VM, and it's, it's too many steps. Basically, I need to have as one or two clicks to get what I want. Like, you know, I need an extended storage, you go and format it. They don't want to do all of that, right? So they want to have one or two clicks. Okay, this is what I want in the compute, where maybe CPUs, memory, and after that I want an extended storage, whether, you know, flash or non-flash, and based on the use case that they have. They want to have, you know, simple workflow. And we looked at, uh, you know, Horizon, 
and we don't want to you know go and make to you know core uh, horizon and we cannot merge from upstream so that is one of the reason actually we wanted to go back and look at different options how you know, other people are using the other public clouds or maybe any other cloud in the world then we looked at netflix they have you know a cool uh, you know workflow built already then we wanted to leverage that so that's how we started with that and uh, we are going to be you know expanding more on that like in integrating with uh, our uh, uh, you know availability monitoring as well we are planning to you know, bring everything into the same dashboard actually so uh, it's on java and one good thing is actually we have a lot of java developers within the organization and if they want to do some cool stuff uh, you know building some new ui or whatever on the html based and uh, we want to leverage them as well because this what this is it enables us to you know bring the entire company into this because when there was a challenge actually when we said okay we are going to be uh, you know working on the open stack then other rest of the organization right they said yeah it's good but how you know it is going to affect my job at the end of the day you know it's everyone question it's coming in and what's my role in that okay we clearly said okay you don't want to do the same thing in over and over you don't want to click the same button and running the same script you have to be an engineer you cannot be a guy you coming in every day at 8 o'clock to office run the same thing over and over you're not learning anything and they're going back in the evening so instead okay the code is there we are all part of it we are not restricting you go and take it and then go to you know meetups or what not and learn to open stack and go and contribute it's good for the company good for the community we are all growing together so it really really enabled us the same thing with asker right okay good so you want to do something that uh, in java okay there you go you go wherever and then you know go and you know work on that so it 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 really you know really helped us to bring the rest of the organization into the whole mix yeah so what is the current scale of the deployment yeah so typically you know we don't share how many definitely it's in multiple thousands for sure thousands mean hypervisor sets of yeah so that's what he was talking about right we introduced caching for that is specifically with keystone yes, yes exactly keystone performance is you see we got and we got you know rabbit mq issues right so basically you know got dropped you know a lot of messages they had to restart them rabbit mq and, and there was one more issue actually we ran into we couldn't even figure out what was happening is okay rabbit mq is running but still you know the messages are not getting spanned to the uh, you know controllers and the communication is not happening between your controllers to you know co compute nodes he said okay rabbit mq everything is running why the hell it's not working and queues everything is up up and running to run your rabbit mq we need to have at least 1 gig of you know var lock 1 gig of var lock space right so later on we figured out because you know it was keep filling up and we didn't have the you know good lock rotation and it was filling up and the uh, vm was not responding back to rabbit mq so it's all you know challenges within uh, you know open uh, within rabbit itself but it takes time to you know identify actually you know what's failing Yes. Yeah, so right now we are managing three controllers with uh, at least 500, 600 hypervisors. 500. Yeah. 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 So we, 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 we are building small clouds. We are not building the whole big cloud. And if something happens, actually, we don't want it to affect the whole cloud. When something happens, okay, one cell it is getting affected. Even still, we are not affecting our real business, right? So we wanted to be a bit careful in that, actually. Yeah, so we are building small clouds, and we wanted to bring everything into you know multiple cells and bring it back into root cell. So that's where actually we are really looking for a single keystone that you always authenticate against this region, and internally it propagates all these tokens to other cells internally. Right. So one bottleneck today is actually we are dealing with the multiple keystones. It's not because of you know we don't want to do that because the other layers in above IIS actually they don't want to deal with multiple. Right. Yes, that's why actually we built Aurora. Actually, you log in with this, and uh, you can select the region where you want to, you know, manipulate. And the same keystone, token, username, and password is working for you. So we'll make sure that when you log in, we authenticate against multiple. Okay. There's a workaround for us, and we'll make sure that the same token is working for you know, all the other regions as well. So we are not going to be keep asking you username and password again, right? Yeah. Which, 
uh, okay load balancers are very critical for our uh, in availability that of course anyone who is running uh, serious business and uh, e-commerce the load balance is you know unavoidable for you guys right so we have our hardware and the load balancer service that we internally built we are managing hundreds and hundreds of load balancers and we have a load balancer service built on top of uh, you know all this right and it is internally built to map our uh, network topology and we haven't seen all those use cases as part of neutron yet because i was one of them in uh, in san diego summit actually we proposed to be bring in all this vendors into the same room we all agree upon the common apis we all agree upon the plugin architecture and also the driver architecture we built all of that but still you know the use cases that we wanted to solve it is not there in neutron so of course we are going to be so far my engineering team i'm uh, i'm really sad these guys are really really unhappy on me that actually i'm asking these guys most of our engineering you know effort into operationalizing open stack rather than you know building the code and uh, you know it's really really you know stopping us not to you know go and have all this you know blueprints created and community go and develop all of that and contribute back to the community with the real use cases and we are going to be focusing on that 2014 for sure and uh, we are building our ci cd and you know jonathan's team actually you know very uh, jonathan so he is building ci and cd for me and uh, my developers actually they are just going to be you know checking in the code and it goes through you know different uh, you know stages in the pipeline and at the end of the day actually we have a you know stable code that is getting into the production so once we have that you know engineers are going to be relieved from the day to day operations and they are going to be focusing on the real time use cases and the real time use cases are going to be translated into blueprints and it's going to be in community actually it's good for the community good for us actually i don't want to deal with you know another set of you know service or the code base within uh, you know paypal to manage all our load balancers because it is again cost and also uh, we and also you know, when we designed our load balancer service internally we missed some obvious things and when i did talk to you know yusuf from citrix and uh, he was running with uh, atlas selby i don't know whether you guys uh, aware of atlas selby and it was started from rackspace and it is in production with hp today and you know even rackspace is also using the same thing and he did a good you know really fantastic job of you know bringing in all this you know different aspect to the uh, you know tenant facing apis and uh, you know we had a lot of you know challenges uh, uh, using load balancers for the real time uh, use cases where we built a lot of operator apis we put together everything into community in the last uh, uh, you know uh, san diego design summit but they are not at realized into neutronet so that definitely we need to put a lot of effort to make it happen for real time use cases yeah yeah for some tech guysly <laughs> yeah so with that okay we start maybe no i think we are done we will maybe I'll, i'll take it there yeah.